I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Still got Zach in the house. Good to be back. Yeah, it's always good to have you in the fold, Zach, back in Louisiana. Um, Any Opelousa catfish on the menu or anything good like that? that I, well, I'll that say get... this. So I went to a place in Maryland. I don't, I'm not sure I'd ever been to Maryland before. I went and, I went last year and spoke over there. There were well, some really great people. I've done that before, yeah. but I mean just kind of mingling with the people. Right. We, we filmed a episode there coming later, and it was fantastic. But we, we meet these people, and we were around the uh, – Chesapeake Bay, which yeah. was beautiful. That is pretty. But I've lived in Louisiana, but I had something happen that I have never experienced before, and it was downright embarrassing or uh, ignominious. Mm. Ooh. Hold on there, Tiger. Whoa. What did you just say? <laughs> ignominious. Someone. Get Chase pulling us okay. out. He's just, he's been waiting for you to get yeah. here so he can impress Zach you with that. I carefully worked that word in here because I had to, although I had to practice it about four times <laughs> and look it up. And get, here we go. We got the, we got the Google search engine. I'm, I'm looking over here. Well, because someone it, what is it ignominious 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 i-g-n-o-m-i-n-i-o-u-s yeah. so he even uh, knows how to spell it so uh because that's when you're embarrassed or disgraced i thought it went in with public disgrace or shame uh, because how, how did you find the word first of all someone Wait. said it to me and uh i just kind of nodded and then went and looked up what was said. So let I me thought. use it in a sentence. Zach was ignominious over his Gators. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> performance on, in the college world series. Move on, y'all. It was embarrassing. Oh, moving along here. <laughs> but, uh, and we should be the opposite, you know, for Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was, I used it there because we actually, uh, it's famous for blue crabs. And now I know Louisiana has them too, but I've never been a part of a blue crab bull. Yeah. You know, we do crawfish. Oh, you're in the place for them. If you go down and, uh, south, they do them more down there, but not as much up here, right? Well, we what, don't have what I'm bringing this up for is it was fantastic. No, they're delicious. I mean, they're absolutely yeah. insanely delicious. That's right. I would say I ate a dozen, and they were big. Right. And so, but it's the same concept as crawfish. So, so did y'all yeah. eat them like, so dad, do they call it molting when the idea, when they're, they don't have the hard shell, they're soft? No, no, we didn't do the soft. I know this. I've them. eaten those in restaurants before. Oh, they are good. Oh, they're, they're good. So well, you nice. eat the, cause there's a, there's you just a. just eat the whole thing. It's yeah. just. There's a time period that happens where they turn soft, the, the molting process or whatever. Right. I don't know when, how often they do that, but they figured out how to capture that moment and sell them and, sell them. and it must be a, a an expensive expensive venture because they're high when yeah, they're yeah, they're, it's, yeah but this was just the cracking open the shells and uh i'm not sure who cooked them i mean or how they cooked them but they had a little they had a little it, it reminded me of crawfish well up there like, like it's shrimp boys but the old in bay that area the old bay everybody yeah. talks about old, old bay, bay yeah, yeah. yeah and we did the cracking you know you do the claws and but even the insides were just absolutely delicious mm -hmm. mm. so i say we need to Start that tradition around here. I mean, because look, it was off the chart. I thought it was better than a crawfish bowl. Yeah. The I mean, just the meat the is better. better. It's yeah. just better. And yeah. a little better payoff, right? Because about I mean, 25 yeah. or 30 years ago, uh, about 25 or 30 canvasback ducks, the fastest duck there is, by the way, and they hit us off here on Moss Lake in the middle of the woods, and they lit right in front of us. I raised up. Killed a couple of them. Other people were shooting too. So I looked on the duck when I picked him up, and he had a band on his leg that was worn to where I couldn't see the numbers on it. But that's a lot of wear, and it's an aluminum yeah. band they he's, put on ducks. He's been around a while. Well, so the I government see. puts on band. They put bands to track them. And you then when you them. turn them in, they give you a certificate because a lot of people may not be familiar. Yeah, they want to know where they're going. But anyway. This is where I your taxpayer dollars are going. Yeah, I sent it to the state police, 
and ask them could they get that number because they got these ways of getting file off, serial numbers, whatever. So they sent me back and gave me the number, and uh, the information on that duck was that duck was banded 12 years earlier in Chesapeake Bay. Man. He had made the trip all the way from the Chesapeake Bay to Louisiana Man, and yeah. back. But it, and it also gone back and forth every year for a dozen years. A dozen years. Wow. But he flew by OPR. He came by, by PR. Me, yeah, and he made was, the wrong stop. And the potty goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a rest stop. That was his fatal mistake. Right I was there. wondering where you were going with that because I it thought. It almost was sworn in two, just a little bit of aluminum. Where's the, where's the Chesapeake Bay? It's, that's a, it's a whole different flyway, right? Yeah. It so is. He that cut, I would think is that, is that somehow he got over. It's not yeah. salt water, but it's kind of like Mar- like marsh, brackish, mar- brackish, brackish yeah, marsh. marsh. Yeah, yeah. It was a fascinating place. I mean, I could I could roam there. I I, I was very fascinated by the. Place. So you were bringing that up. It, it reminded me, Dad, of I don't think I told this story on the podcast. We were up in Ohio recently speaking at an event. Mom and Dad and Lisa and I, and so we go in this event, and I, and I assume I guess it's because they had us there. We walk in and we're meeting all the VIPs, uh, which are the very involved patrons that are supporting this ministry. And they're all sitting around tables and we just kind of walk in, everybody claps, you know, and we were just kind of meeting and greeting. And I guess somebody had the idea here in the heartland of Ohio that they were going to do crawfish and shrimp bowl. Mm-hmm. And so in the middle of every table was a big thing and they were, and all their things were full of shrimp and crawfish, and there were some sausage in there, mm. potato and carrots, I mean, uh, corn like we do it. But I noticed when I'm walking to the tables, I'm meeting folks, hey, glad y'all are here. Everybody like around the table, about there'd be eight people at a table. Six of them had, I mean, the bowl was full. Nobody's even touched it. Two people would have like two mangled crawfish sitting in front of them. And that'd be it. And I was like, y'all not eating these crawfish? And they were like, well, we don't, it's not... It's not worth it. Well, what uh, is it? They couldn't I mean, figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. So I'm doing a little private lesson, showing them how to do it. A couple of them are like, eh. But it was really interesting going around. And then I come up on this table, and this one big old boy is sitting there, and he's got a pile of crawfish <laughs> hulls in front of him, husk. And I was like, you're not from Ohio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, where are you from? He said, home of Louisiana. I said, all right, I get it. You know what you're doing. Well, it is funny. You... The more you do it, the better you get at peeling, right. which on the crabs was a little easier. I mean, once I watched our host, I thought, okay. I mean, it's a, they got their system there. And yeah. it first couple. Got the little I, mallet I, and the fork. Got the mallet. Well, we they didn't, we just used mallet and You see they have hands. those little tiny forks, but yeah. We didn't use, uh, well, it was just, yeah. this was just, you know, gorging, yeah. barbarian style. <laughs> <laughs> no. Put right up your no utensils. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I was I was looking for a picture on my phone because uh, we, we live in Asheville or Black Mountain area, uh, North Carolina, and one of my buddies sent me a picture. They were doing a, a big low country boil, which involved crawfish, and when he sent the picture of what he was about to boil, I was like, he said, you don't know anything about that. And I looked at it, and all the crawfish were dead. I was like, yeah, you're right. That ain't how you do it. Not good. I, don't eat, I, said, I said, don't eat the ones with the straight tail. And then I put, which will be all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? so, hey, they thought they figured it out. They've hey, been out of the water a little too long. Yeah. I said, don't eat. You never eat crawfish that were boiled uh, dead. They need to be alive. Well, and, that, and that tail curls up, which is how you know it was alive when it they It is kind of interesting that crawfish and crabs – I mean, they are nature's gods because he created nature. They are his cleanup system. They're the they're the vacuum cleaner of the uh, outdoors. They come in, everything that's died, they go in, they, they're cleaning everything. They'll pick something clean. If you fall in the water, Dad used to say this, they'll pick you clean. Yeah, yeah. They will. And so it's really interesting because these delicious, you know, crustaceans are basically there's not a lot between something well, dead and I mean, you let's face it they're delicious because you boil them in <laughs> all kind of spices and then you no. i mean hey, that <laughs> crab meat it was it's just crabs white. No, crabs it is. different but crawfish the crabs are the same way they're just eating yeah, but there's it's no salt, it's fishy saltwater. taste there's no and i just i think it now you'll talk about god having a sense of humor because if you you can zoom up on the blue crab and this thing looks like an alien. Well, we make yeah. movies about aliens <laughs> and, and they look creatures like that are me. Oh, they're, they're they're like you would never consider that this is something that I want to put in my body. You would think this thing, if it 
actually did invade my body, it may take over. And you got, you know, Alien 7, blue crab. <laughs> but it's yeah. so good. And I just, I think there's something about that that's unexplainable that's only. Uh, it's a God you know, thing. Yeah. It, F- it, Phil, do you remember the year? I, you may not remember this, but when Jeff and I were in college, there was about a three week window. We went out to one of our buddies' place who had a. He they used to duck hunt on a in a rice field, and we were going to go out there and go frog gigging because he heard some big frogs out there. Well, we pulled up out there, there were crawfish just all over the levees. I mean, like we would drive the four wheeler, and they're just run, I mean, millions of them. And so we came back to your house and told you about it, and and you said, "Boys, well, go out there and get them traps." You had like forty or fifty traps, and you said, "Just bring me bring me back a couple coolers full of crawfish. Y'all can use those." And so we went back out. a little money. We, yeah, we did. We went out there, and for two two or three weeks, I mean, it was 24-7. We, would, we started off with with, uh, with roadkill, and we took some, you said buffalo carp. You said put buffalo head in there, top the heads off. So we did that. But then that got too much work, so we were making so much <laughs> money that we were like, let's just go buy a box of chicken. We'd buy a big box of chicken from the store in South Monroe, so and then chunk of chicken. We just there. chunk a, a, a chicken quarter in there, yeah. and throw it out there. And thirty, forty minutes, the, the traps would be full. We'd pull them back out, load them up in the croaker sacks, and take them down to Cormier's and sell them. Come back, get more chicken, and it was just. I mean, and we just kept doing it as like until they stopped. It, actually, the farmer kicked us off. He said, "Now that's you take these farming my, my my farm. This is my farm. You know, you got the duck hunting lease. You don't have the crawfish. You know, uh, that's what happens when it comes down to a product. Then yeah. you find out and all the money. It come, when money's involved, everybody gets a little stingy. But uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that took me back to the crawfish days, Jay. We used to crawfish our property here for a year or two. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of work. Well, it was just embarrassing. I was sharing that I I just didn't know they were that good, and that was a thing. So I didn't want other people to miss that. You need to do that as soon as possible. It was fantastic. The blue crab, the yeah, blue crab, crab steaming. Bang. Yeah, I mean they could have used a little more heat. I like you know my lips to get numb when I'm eating crawfish, but overall, I mean I've always said when you leave Louisiana, you know you left the cuisine, but. In this case, I was pleasantly surprised. Well, when I go into a place, so we'll go in, I go to a restaurant, I'm traveling, I'm in some part of the country I've never been. I was like, what is your state known for food? What yeah. are you known for? That's what you want to eat. that's what well, I want to eat. That's kind of what happened. Here. Right. You know, I, we don't go to restaurants. You know, we go film these episodes. Yeah. We, we're in remote places, and we're, we're we part of the dynamic of the show is we we just like to live off the land. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it's famous for, we let's go get it. And uh, so that's kind of what happened. But so I, when I went to the that Panhandle shelf uh, shelf above like Tallahassee area, there was yep. a little town called Perry, Florida. Yep. And I was like, "What are you known for?" And they were like oysters. I said, "Let's right do now. it." You know, and and they were they were fantastic. I oh, mean, that, they were yeah, the we first to, place I've eaten oysters that were like Louisiana oysters. Yeah, yeah, that's a big thing in Florida, North Florida. You know, it's, you get around and we have a crawfish bowl in Louisiana, North Florida. You build a fire, you put a little grill on top, and you just th- they just throw fresh oysters on there, and they pop open, and you just sit there all night and shuck Delicious. oysters. It really is really good. good, both raw and the other. Yeah. So, All right, well, I'm getting hungry, so better take a break. So, Zach, it's, um, we love having uh, sponsors that kind of share our values and what we're all about. We do. The Unashamed Podcast, and our friends at Barrel Buddy, uh, are definitely one of those companies, wouldn't you say, just based on our conversations with yep. them? Yeah, they are. They're great guys. Uh, they love Jesus. They they love the outdoors. So they're very similar to, to our, our family. And I love it because they're like us. They were a small business, obviously, in the hunting world. Mm-hmm. Uh, their deal is making sure your weapon's clean. Our deal is making sure your duck calls are clean and work. Uh, and so, you know, we share a lot with them. I've got an ongoing Bible study going on with those guys. And so we love doing business with them and really want to encourage you guys to check them out. Everybody, whether you're just a a shooter, a gun enthusiast, a hunter, uh, you need a clean weapon and they've come up with a great product made out of these white polymers. They fit any, uh, any rifle, uh, any pistol and any shotgun gauge. Uh, and they're a cut above all the other ways that we used to clean our weapons. So check these guys out. Uh, cleaner guns make a responsible gun owner. Check them out. Barrelbuddy.com. B-A-R-R-E-L buddy.com. Let 
Did y'all make me anything since I'm in town? Is, like, I asked, started, is there any Opelousa catfish? What's on the henny menu I'm for? Go find some blue crabs and let's get on back on that. <laughs> Louisiana style. Yeah, you we got do have blue things. crabs. I'll do reason. crawfish or uh, the fishing, you know, it's not optimum. You miss that run. Yeah. But I'm sure we could we could do something. Come up with something. Well, I guess we're going to feast on the words. I, I don't think that's, that's, that's where we're headed. So we're, we're in there you go. Luke chapter six. Blessed uh, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. <laughs> As their stomach okay. growls. Hey. Or Luke said, blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Ah, oh, that's good. I'm hungry. So, well, we left off in Luke six. We got back on the planks and we basically, I think we agree. I think y'all agree with me. I don't think it was necessarily intended for humor. No, you give you've given me a new insight on that because I'd always kind of I'd kind of taught that as the other way, but I think your your points are much more salient and deeper. Well, yeah. when you think about it, he even went, if he was being hyperbolic, it's there's a deep meaning there. But it, it's yeah. so hyperbolic it didn't it wouldn't. There's millions of more wood particles. Yeah. It, it, it's not it's Why not did he a go joke. for the one that's... It's that not was, a joke. Right. You, you're, you're looking... It's all to make yourself feel better. Yeah. By throwing rocks at other people's... And I don't want to say little sins, because his whole point was we all have an enormous problem. Yeah. It's called selfish ambition. Yeah. And then we cover it up. And that's why we got into, in the bonus time, we got into Genesis 3, where you see this happen in verse uh, 7, where after they sinned, no, nobody told them yeah. the consequences of it, but they did what we all do. You start a cover-up. They went and got fig leaves. They made coverings for themselves. God handed down the consequences, which resulted in them being separated from God, which our sins separate us from, you know, from God. Right. There were other consequences, the pains in childbirth, yeah. uh, you know, the conflict in marriage, the work in the ground with the, uh, the thorns and the evil one, the snake being used, so it had to crawl on its belly. And then it says, and the Lord made cover suitable coverings for them and which was animal skins, which meant, you know, that he, he was showing you a, a vision into what would later become Jesus on a cross, which was a sacrifice, blood being shed to cover up their, their wickedness, the right. shame yep. of it all. And I mean, that's in verse uh, 21 of Genesis three. So that's kind of what we did. And the point is, cause when he, he moves on of this analogy about the plank and the speck, he says, you hypocrite, which is in the last part of 42, but then it gets to 43 and it says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up, look, in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out, of the, for out of the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks. And then he gives another analogy that says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And this kind of goes back to that James 1 mm -hmm. about you looking in a mirror and then forget, forgetting what you look like and not putting into practice what the Lord says. He says, I will show you what he is like, who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Yeah, I think it's it's you can't overestimate what's happening here. This concept of of self introspection. Yeah, I mean, that's really what he's talking about. That's you mentioned about. you mentioned the fig leaf, which is a perfect like parallel passage to that the Genesis one through three you know story, which is you you said I think in overtime this is a, it, it's repeated over and over again in scripture. But what's the fig leaf about? It's about the it's about the refusal to look inward. Right. So you cover up and you hide because I'm not going to look at myself. 
I don't want to look at myself. We talked about it in, in the James passage. You don't want to look in the mirror. You don't want to see yourself. But that's the, that's the main point here. I think sometimes we read this passage and it's misused a lot about, oh, don't be judgmental anytime someone makes a moral judgment in, in like cultural debates. Oh, don't judge. Don't judge. That's, like, we're really missing the point. It's not, it's not that the judgment is wrong as much as it is that what he's talking about is you're not looking at yourself. Like you're actually yeah. using other people's sin as a distraction from looking at your own stuff. And that's what he's drawing us into is look at yourself. Like look you gotta at yourself. Remember, you got all these texts. They're leading up to the to the mantra. He, they they preached John the Baptist, Jesus sent out the apostles, sent them out, and he's showing you what kingdom behavior looks like. Yeah. Because the kingdom is at hand. I mean, so he's giving them the final briefing on the kingdom before Acts 1 comes along and 2, when the, they saw the kingdom of God come with power and they began to, begin to preach Jesus. He was showing them what kingdom people would look like. Yeah, because you got to remember they 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 don't know about the kingdom of God. They they they're saying do what they they don't even yeah. understand. They don't get it. This mag, I mean, amazing transfer of power where Jesus will be worldwide in His people who are the kingdom of God. It is here, and this is how it should behave. That's a great point because I think when we read this, a lot of times it's because the big debate in Christian circles is: is it faith? Or is it works, right? How would, you, how would you spot them? Yeah. Well, if you follow these texts, that's how you'll spot them. Yeah, so it's not, it's not even as prescriptive as we think it is. I think sometimes we read this on one side, oh, this is, this is all the work you got to do to be saved. But then we're like, well, no, because it's what Christ did, did, not us. And you're, you're trying to reconcile that. I think this is very, I think it feels right. I think it's, this is a lot more descriptive of this is what someone looks like. Who is in the kingdom? This is so. This that's is what right. someone well, looks what, like who's been transformed to the yeah. to his, your passage you mentioned in the last podcast of Paul talking mm -hmm. about the transformative power of the Spirit. This is what it looks like. It's descriptive. Well, that's what he yeah. meant in Luke six. That's where Luke came at it. He was like, "We feel like a successful kingdom, or or you know, in a worldly kingdom, is how much money you have, how comfortable yeah. you are." Yeah. Yep. How much you're laughing and gloating and winning. Uh, people are recognizing you as great. I mean, that's what Luke 6, 20 through 26 is all about. And he's, he's like. He's showing them what it's like that it's never finished because there will always be sin before you come to Jesus and before you before that all happens. Uh by one sacrifice, which he's fixing to do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, giving them what the kingdom looks like. But he said he has made that sacrifice he's fixing to make. You're going to be operating under a system whereby by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You get in the kingdom of God through your faith in Jesus and what he's going to do it hadn't happened yet, but as you get, that's why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's a documented, detailed account of Jesus going to the cross, dying on the cross, being all of them. So, and, and, and the word, go out and make disciples. What he's showing you is, look, he's already made you perfect. All your sins in the past are yeah. covered. It's not like law where once in and you go back under the law again. You, you're being made holy, and it's a, and it's a, ongoing battle, if you want to call it, from the time you run up on Jesus, you say, It's a process. He's made me perfect. My past sins, he's not counting against me. My future sin, he's not holding them against me. He's there 24-7 to keep me cleansed. So you put it all together, you know, he's given you the way out. And it's really, it's not burdensome, but it is a change of heart to know that none of your sins in the past are counted against you. And none of your future ones are counted against you. Yeah. Just go, and here's the way you should look and the things you should do. So it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I think that well, uh, it's, it, you can't get two things confused. You can't get 
your justification confused with your sanctification. That, that is correct. And I think that's what's happening in this well, discussion. Explain that for people who are not up on what those exactly mean and the difference therein. Yeah, your justification is is that you're freed from the penalty of sin. So that's what Phil just mentioned. Like you don't stand before God as a Christian who's covered in Christ's blood. You're you're not guilty in a court of law. Like your your mm-hmm. sins are not held against you. Sanctification is is you're freed from the power of sin progressively as you walk in the spirit. And I think it's what this whole idea of works is about when we read these passages about fruit, or you mentioned the, the passage yep. in, in James. Yep. Listen to the second half of that verse in James. You mentioned the first part about you you know, anyone who is a hearer of the word, this is James one twenty three, and not a doer. He is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But then there's the contrast to that, verse 25. But one who looks, and I love these words like this, intently at the perfect law, and then he defines that law, the law of liberty, which is the same kind of language he used that Paul used in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, and abides in it. Uh, so you're, you're talking about living in it, not having become for, a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. And I think this is like the, this idea that I'm, I'm coming into this, this walk with Jesus now, and I'm intentionally looking intently into a perfect law. I'm living by the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 tells us that the, the Spirit actually produces fruit. Yep. And all of that fruit is not even my fruit. It says it's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. So when you go back to this passage in Luke and he talks about like a good tree is going to produce good fruit, yep. what he's saying is when you are abiding in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. As I meditate on his word, as I pray the Psalms, as I participate in, in the kingdom life, I, 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 I meet with the brothers at the church, that, that transforms a person. And over time, over 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 years of walking with him, then all of a sudden the spirit, not me. I don't produce love, joy, peace, patience. If you tell me, I mean, you meet with someone who's in the 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 depths of a of a battle in their marriage, and you say, "Well, just love your wife," and you're like, "How do you do that? How do you choose that?" And you don't really choose that. You don't choose love. You don't choose joy. If you don't have joy. I mean, if, I mean, you can't just say, "Okay, I choose joy today." That doesn't work. But what you can do is you can do the things that God calls us to do, and then the Spirit will produce those those fruit that fruit. It's His fruit. Not, it's not the fruit of Zach Dasher. It's the fruit of the Spirit: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self control. That's what God produces in us when we look intently into the perfect law over a period of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yep. true. I have a slightly different take on it. I agree with what you're saying, but I think. When you think about these, this analogy that he's doing, uh, it's just like the, you know, I make, I make, yeah, when he said the tree and its fruit, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. We got two trees here. Uh, and he's talking about looking into yourself. You got two foundations or two, or one found one with a foundation, two houses here. Well, what, what, What are the choices he's saying? So it's basically comes down to you or the Lord. So either, you know, this tree, if you put your hope and trust in what you find in yourself, wrong tree. Yeah. Bad fruit's coming. That tree's got to be uprooted. It's got to die. Yeah. And we got to get a part of another tree, which is, you know, get to John 15, you you see that. You yeah. remain in that tree. Well, here, I mean, it's like that, reminds me of that joke. I don't know if I can remember this joke off the top of my head. Uh, that, you know, two guys, they're climbing a mountain. They both slip. They fall into a ledge. They're trapped. One of them says, I, there's two possible ways up from here. And one of them says, I am positive that if we go left up this way, 100%, we can make it. And the other one says, well, I am not sure. I think if we go this other way, we'll make it. 
And so the one who is sure takes off and he slips and he falls down the mountain and dies. The other one who wasn't real sure, he goes his way and he makes it. And you say, well, what, what is the joke here? Well, who was saved? Which one made it? The one who didn't The die. one who wasn't sure. Yeah. He wasn't sure. The one who picked the right rock. Yeah. <laughs> he picked the right path. Yeah. Even though he wasn't real sure about it. So my point is, no matter how sure you think you are, you know, in your own mind or... And, and even you could be and, surely mistaken. So well, a lot well, of people. Paul was, what it, if Paul said he persecuted the church in good conscience? That's right. So the, my point is, it's not the strength of your faith; it's the object. And I think that's, that's what he's talking about here. Yeah. It. What, what did you build it on? Because in this context, he's talking about context. He's talking about: Are you building this on your inner hidden heart and agenda? Because whatever comes out of it. The overflow of the heart, but that's the, why the mouth speaks. That's why Al, rightfully so, what differentiates the trees is the qualities of the fruit. Good is that which can help others. Good is that which can help others. Figs and grapes, while bad, bad fruit, is that which harms others, thorns and briars. Right. Al threw that in. Jesus reminds us, the heart is the source of the fruit, and the mouth is the evidence of whether it's good or bad. So, yeah, my point was in that. That, that was a is great point, Al. That, that fruit, you can tell on how it impacts people. Yep. And so, and Zach well, made a point earlier about culture, because we think, well, we got to remove ourselves from culture because they're never going to understand kingdom principle. But I disagree with that. When I look at movements that come across, especially in the last 10 years, we've had some movements come across our culture. Now, we're... And look, we're we are qualified to talk into culture because we live here. Yep. I've raised my daughters, and now I'm in the process of raising granddaughters that are almost grown. So I have a, something to say. And what I would say is, what is your movement producing? What does the fruit look like? And I'm taking out salvation. I'm just talking about when you look at a movement of people and yep. something they believe in strongly. You can what, tell where it's coming. You can where, tell where it's coming from, where sure. it's going. Is it helping people or is it harming? Right, but I, yeah, I think the key is is when you address it, these issues and culture, though, it's it's coming at it from the perspective of of it's not us versus them. That's right. And, and I think that, like Phil said, I've heard Phil say this before. He said uh, something like, I've identified the problem and the problem is me, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or uh, Chesterton said, you know, what's wrong? He had this famous essay that he wrote in a book he wrote too, called what's wrong with the world. Um, and then his tongue in cheek answer was me. And so he, the, the point is, is that when we pontificate on all these cultural things, we do have to recognize that all of this, this capacity for evil and deception and lies, it is in all of us. I think to Jason's point, though, when you talk about like how do we anchor, because it's not just, you have to anchor this in the right tree, and the role of the Holy Spirit in it is is pivotal. I, I thought about this Romans 8 passage, because it talks about um, basically not sinning and then doing the right thing. And it's like, well, well I, I thought I didn't have to do anything. I thought Christ did everything for me. Yeah, He did pay for the, paid the way, but he did send the Spirit, and he did say, it's good that I go, because if I don't go, then he's not going to come. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And then there's this, this idea in Romans 7 where he's Paul's talking about what he does, and he's like, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing, and then when I do the right thing, the, like basically evil's right there, and I'm back and forth. And he, he kind of ends Romans 7 with this question of despair, who will rescue me from this body of death? And he answers it. And Thanks. by the time he gets to Romans 12, it's pretty good on what kind of behavior. Yeah, because Romans 12, he gets into what it looks like to worship God. Yep. And, and, and so He also says, I know that nothing good lives in me. Yeah, so you, you got that's right. You got to connect yeah. with the one who is good. And the and the only way you're going to do that is through Jesus, but and surrendering to Him, you know, so you a, surrender to Jesus, but the, but then the, the the connection point, the application of our salvation, Jesus accomplished it, but who who applies it to us is the Holy Spirit, and that's what Romans eight is about. It's about life in the Spirit, and it's about what we do. So He says here in verse. Hang on, two, hang on before you read that. Let's take another. Point. He says here in verse uh, 12 of Romans 8, he says, So then, brethren, 
we are under obligation. So there we are under obligation still, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die, to Jason's point earlier. But if by the Spirit, then this is the Holy Spirit, you are, you are, you, you're gonna, there's an action here. You are putting to death the deeds of the body you will live. For all of those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if we are children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So I think it's this it's this connection with the Holy Spirit as he reveals reality to us, and then we submit to that. That's when we get the spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, Romans, uh, uh, Galatians 5. Yeah, and fruit's always character issues. I mean, I think this whole thing has been about integrity and God's character, which is the polar opposite of being a hypocrite, which is trying to give the image of something that you are not, which is the context of what he's saying. Because this all came after he he defines what is prideful. You thinking you've arrived because you got a lot of money and you're comfortable and you're noticeable and you're recognizable and you're powerful versus being weak, humble, full of tears and being insulted. Well, when you embrace that, that that may be the road as as a follower of Jesus, he, he then supplies the power and the comfort. And to go along with what you said, that's why in the context of love your enemies in 635 that we read, it says exactly what you just read. He said, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Mm. Well, why? Because he taught you this. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. But if you're not rooted in that, that's why I said when you're trying to remove the speck out of someone's eye, you're coming at it from a place of, well, God did this surgery on me yeah. and I, and it, my surgery was way more extensive. <laughs> it, there's an enormous problem we all have. It's like, if you haven't had that happen, it's easy to do surgery on someone where, where it's not personable. And you know, look, and you know, this analogy and, and, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of procedures that are, that are happening, they, they tend to be rough because they're just doing their job. Yeah. But when you have someone who understands that they had this same surgery done to them, well, you're you're then speaking the truth in love. You're being gentle. You're prepared to First Peter three fifteen to give everyone a, an account of why you have hope, but you're doing it with gentleness and respect. Because you remember, at some point, I was in the pig pen. Yeah, I good. was a million miles away, and I think that's that's what he's trying to balance in your heart. This has got to come from that humble. Spirit, but you're gonna, but you're gonna be attacked if you make a stand for truth, and you're gonna be called names. You're gonna be called things like bigot and whatnot. But I think about like what's the marker of what he, what Jace just described there? Uh, how what does that look like? Here's how here's how I judge it. This is anecdotal. I think it's actually I think it's scriptural too. I, I ask the question: Who who do you eat with? Like who's at your dinner table? Yeah, like, I, I I could tell a lot about a person by who they eat with, and like I know you've been accused of things, but I look at who I look at who sits down at your dinner table, Phil, and I'm like, I don't know many people eating with the people you eat with. Jesus ate with sinners. Exactly. You, you've eaten with some. I mean, there's been some some cats roll through here that I mean, it's like the world would be like, wait, what? I thought you were you know, all the accusations I hear, but I'm like, I'm not seeing that. I, I'm not seeing that in in who's in your living room. Who's sleeping on your couch? Who you put up over the years? I don't. I, I just. It, 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 it's like that's a. It's been risky. Yeah. You know what I mean. Well, but, I'll I'll share a story that just happened to me. Now, a few podcasts ago, I, I offered a rebuke to a man that showed up at my house. You know, got through the gate late at night, knocked on my door. You know, wanted a picture. So, uh, and I gave him the picture and a little bit of a rebuke. But then I called him out on the podcast. I was like, hey. Me showing up my house, you know, late at night. I mean, that's a dangerous precedent to set. 
So somehow or another, this guy figured out my email and sent me a, a very nice apology. Uh, and so I type, I, I sent him, I reached out to him and I said, you're forgiven. And uh, the reason he, I, I was so quick to do that is because he realized that, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't a wise thing, <laughs> to, yeah. you know, to do and, over a picture. I mean, come on. So it, we began a dialogue in what really matters, which is, uh, you know, having Jesus be Lord of our life. And so I said, you're always welcome here now. You know, after you send me an email, of course, and you, you perform the social etiquette that people do about showing up. But if we want to talk about that, we will. But the reason I was quick to forgive, and you're like, well, what are you, sanctioning that? No, we, we had a conversation, and we, you know, got into his life and his heart and his need and desire to have Jesus the Lord of your life. Because I'm like, no, I'll have a conversation about that. I'll yeah, and uh, and it was a it was a sad story. He he, I I thought the guy was thirty years old. He was actually sixteen years old, which made a lot of a lot of sense. He had a full grown beard, which was impressive. You don't always have the wisest <laughs> th- yeah. thoughts. Well, and look, sixteen ha- hadn't had a father in his life, yeah. and uh, so and I thought, you know, it everything started making sense to me. Yeah, that's good. You know, nobody told him at some point you don't do this, right? And and I called him out on it and became like a father figure to him. But now he could have got mad and said, well, he embarrassed me or whatever. But he, he realized that I was right. And that's kind of a socially unacceptable thing. But it led to a need for moral direction and making better decisions, which led to uh, you know us discussing Jesus. So he's now reading the book of John. And the next time he comes in town, he will come over and we will talk about Jesus. Yeah, that's an invited guest. Which I think, Jay's that illustrates exactly what he's talking about in this text. Jesus is what qualifies us to impact culture and people. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's Jesus. We're all firmly established in that. We can't do it on our own. It's it's what he – I kept going back to qualifications there because when he talks about judging and condemning, I'm not qualified for that because yep. I don't know people's hearts. Well, right. And that was my point. I, but when it I, comes to I, forgiving and giving, I am qualified. Well, I for attempted that. to take a speck out of his eye. But once he responded in a positive, humble way, we both recognize we both have planks. Yeah. And let's talk about that right. and, uh, you know, find our find some kind of relationship in Jesus, which is really what life is all about. So I think that point of what I'm talking about and even how we impact, not just inside the kingdom of God, but outside the kingdom of God is you have to be willing to engage people to explain to them what good fruit is and what bad fruit is. I thought about, here's a text from Hebrews 6. Here's the way the Hebrew write. And and by the way, Hebrews 6 is a context where people are leaving Jesus to go back under a system of law. And here's what he said about this in verse 7, Hebrews 6, 7. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on, on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receive the blessing of God. So this idea about good fruit, right? But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. What we're trying to do is get people to see that good fruit that blesses other people blesses you in the process. When you're producing thorns and thistles, ultimately you produce things that not only harm other people, but it harms you. What happens ultimately to the tree that doesn't produce good fruit? It's burned up. Yeah. And so it, just if I was going to go out and clear me an orchard to plant fruit trees so that I could bless those and give away my fruit or make jelly or whatever I was going to do with it, what do you do first? You clear out all the stuff that's bad and you put good things in its place. So I think ultimately self-reflection is to get us to a place that blesses other people around us and then ultimately blesses us by the process. So, I mean, I yeah. see that as something that makes us more impacting of culture more willing to take on a 16-year-old who, do, who who doesn't know what this truth is. Well, yeah, I think the irony of all this is Jesus is making these illustrations because he wanted you to think. And uh, I've had so many arguments about this kind of stuff because when you go to the illustration mode, you know, there's always some guy who says, 
Well, briars have berries that are edible. Yep. I mean, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, you you can only get the good fruit from the good tree. But if you hang out in a briar patch, it yeah, you're going to eat uh, once a year. There's some, some nice berries, but you're going to be shredded from one end to the other. And there's also a lot of snakes that hang Big out rattlesnakes gonna in be briar hanging. patches. Yeah. And uh, so I just think, you know, when you start looking at this from a spiritual level, I mean, I look at that as to say, yeah, it, it's all an image thing. And, you know, the briar patch says, oh, look at my nice berries, you know. Yep. But, boy, it's a very small reward for, for a, a lot life, of work. For a life of pain, <laughs> a lot of work, and a lot of other things hiding in the briar patch that will kill you. That's right. Oh, it, I remember my mom when you said she'd say, go out there and pick some blackberries. I'm, I'm going to make a blackberry cobbler. And so we'd go out there, what seemed like hours, probably wasn't that long, but I mean, as kids, you're thinking, man, we are just piling them up. You you come back in with a bowl like this right here, you have just a handful, I mean, and then she's like, not enough. <laughs> and you spend all day. Your you know, hands are sore because oh, you, you got the like, thorns in them. And then you get there, and when you finally get your harvest, I mean, it, 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 I mean they are, they're great to eat, but it's always disappointing the, the, the amount of work. And what you got to go through to get a blackberry that's stuck in a or in a, in a thorn bush? I mean, you, you, your hands are bleeding. You've worked all day for. It's not the same thing as going into a lush garden in the in a, on a tropical island well, with, uh, with pineapples and just and bananas hanging. Low from hanging the, mango. Well, that's well, why I think when a he different story in John's version of an illustration that was similar that Jesus gave. He's yeah. like, I'm I'm the tree. Yeah. You're just a part of it, and you you fall off. You're like a dead branch that's piled that's right. up and burned. I mean, it's a very graphic thing, and so that I think that's what takes the pressure off of you trying to be something that you're not and and realizing you know we have an enormous problem and being in Jesus being a part of that is does take a a sense of humility i mean that i think that's the the thrust don't the mature mayhaw trees have the big long thorns on them and so it's really interesting when you're scooping up those mayhaws and making that jelly it's fantastic but when we were kids and had to climb the tree to shake the tree oh trust me it was injurious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was rough because, but it, it's an interesting point. That's why Phil sent you guys up there. He of was course like... he did. <laughs> so we were, we were on the outer edges, you know. Well, you... And you see some trees that only have thorns. You know, I've told this yeah. story before, but there was a bullfrog one night under a tree, but I didn't stop and assess what kind of tree it was because it was dark and I was focused on the frog. You're going for the delicious frog. Well, life. exactly. So I, about the time I was fixing to, to grab him, he jumped. Well, I jumped because that's what you do. But when I jumped, it was, I got too close to the tree and one of those blue thorns, you know, those trees on the riverbank. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it it impaled me behind my ear, Ooh. and there was some kind of toxin in There's there. There's a toxin on them. It made me sick, and I just, you know, my my, the, my neck swole up. I got <laughs> nauseated. You know, I'm throwing up, and I mean, I was like. Sounds like Hunger Games. All, yeah, all for a frog, which was awesome, but my point is that tree needs to be cut down and burned. <laughs> That's it there. Well said. <laughs> you, there's nothing coming out of that uh, but bad, <laughs> which I think was his point here. And that frog, did you get the frog? Back? I got the frog. So the frog wisely thought, you know what, I'm going to get under this thing because yeah, somebody comes along out here trying to pick me up, but then he didn't realize he had Jason. This year when we were picking up Mayhaws, Dan and I, we were out there and water was about knee deep at some such stage, and I backwater back and forth, you know. So we took little nets, but we were to be sitting there getting mayhaws, and I looked up one morning, I just looked up, and it was a cotton mouth, you know. I mean, you know, about the size of my arm just come, just coming through right there where we was picking up. I was looking around, you know, I got a little net in my hand, no gun, no stick, no staff, no way, and that cotton mouth just goes on by. This, but I'm watching him. So what I'm saying is to get the berries, sometimes you're stepping around some dangerous creatures. That's right. Mm. Which is kind of part of the whole context of what we're talking about. And also, and we'll shift gears a little bit. We're almost out of time in our overtime segment. We'll talk a little bit about, we hadn't said much about the secondary illustration, which is the building. 
because it, it's basically built on the same concept, but yeah. it's kind of how you build that up to what that looks like. If you start out with a bad, bad foundation, then you're going to build something that won't last is, is the 100%. same illustration that falls in. So we'll explore that a little bit more in our overtime segment if you want to follow us over. It's uh, blazetv.com slash unashamed as, uh, as we wrap up Luke 6. We'll see you in overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.